can use this exquisite teaching of the Buddha to, um, to help us be happy and happy in a very deep sense. Um, a happiness that um, is stable through all the ups and downs of life. It can be a little bit difficult to imagine how that's possible if you haven't yet experienced it, but it's actually possible to feel grumpy, angry, hurt, frightened, um, as if everything's falling apart and still in the background, solid and peaceful. I live with a, another nun who will say, wah, 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 I feel so grumpy. Ha 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 ha. And it's like, yeah, there's, there's the, you know, the passing weather, and then there's the, um, you know, really internally stable climate. And even if we don't have it externally, we can um, develop our our way of thinking, our way of acting, our way of speaking that changes the way we are living, interacting with one another and the elements of our character um, that changes our habits. So when you think about it, you know, what do we really have control over? We certainly can't control what other people are saying or doing or what they think of us. Uh, as much as we may try, um, we can't avoid being blamed. No one avoids that, not even the Buddha. Uh, we can't uh, control the surroundings that we're in to a large degree. But what we can control, the only things really, are the way we speak and act and even think so I find it very inspiring and encouraging and empowering when the Buddha talked about how we can come to a place where we can think what we want to think when we want to think it we can train the mind um, to really observe reality and see it as it actually is And I have to say, there's some kind of spiritual magic that goes on. It feels like magic when we put in um, the effort, hopefully with a kind of joy and enthusiasm to practice, that insight arises, that um, this kind of internal peace, tranquility, joy arises even in times when ordinarily you would expect to be falling apart because things are falling apart and somehow the alchemy of walking this noble eightfold path instead produces a situation where things are falling apart and you're not falling apart you're solid and even happy so how does this happen well, this morning, I want to look into what's generally called right view and right intention. Now, the only reason these things are right and not wrong is because they lead to this happiness and stability, this insight into the nature of reality that lets us, helps us be free, free from all clinging, from all suffering. So that's the ultimate but along the way we experience it in doses and our life um, becomes steadily steadily not like a definite constant progression but if you look back um, two years before when you're uh, when we're kind of living by normal worldly values and encouraged by um, normal you know greed, hatred, and delusion, then when we look back at the way things were before we started to dig into understanding Dhamma and dig into practice, then we really see a difference. 
And we see it all the time when people come to our uh, little temple in California. People come and they're stressed and, and they're suffering. And first of all, they start to keep the five precepts, which uh, Ayasoma talked about yesterday. And they start to see their life changing and they start to become uh, less affected by all the stress at work and the people that are, you know, saying and doing whatever they're doing and all those things that are outside of our control. So right view leading us to more happiness and less suffering and right intention. Uh, they're considered to be the um, wisdom factors of the path. So you have the, the sila or virtue factors and you have the samadhi or meditation factors and then you have the wisdom and the wisdom part is comes first in the ordering because we have to have a little bit of wisdom to even get going it was your wisdom that brought you to come here this weekend even on your birthday <laughs> because you know there's something good in it already and you know that it kind of goes against the way of the world which is clearly spinning out of control. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, and, and so it's like you, in order to just step upon the path, we have to have a certain amount of right view. Now there are classical definitions and tons of discussions and all kinds of things written about these qualities or factors. Um, but I want to focus on what we can do to practice particularly. And there's a definition, um, you find it in the middle length discourses in a, a discourse called Right View, where Venerable Sariputta is being asked about Right View. And one of the things that he says is that Right View can be de defined or described as knowing the difference between what's wholesome and what's unwholesome. Again, wholesome and unwholesome by the Buddha's definition is what leads to peace and happiness and what leads to um, suffering and misery. So the Buddha and, the, and Venerable Sariputta in this case mentions 10 things that are wholesome and their opposites that are unwholesome. And the Buddha actually talks about this in over a hundred suttas. It's mentioned again and again and again and again. So these top 10 <laughs> are really important. And he starts with, it's wholesome and right view to avoid killing living beings. And it's unwholesome. And we have to have wrong view in order to intentionally kill a living being. And as Ayasoma pointed out yesterday, you know, it's even those little tiny living beings. And I'm going to talk more about that probably this afternoon when I talk about the, the sila or the virtue aspects of the path, right action, right speech, and right livelihood. And then the second wholesome thing is, as you might guess, um, avoiding taking what isn't given. And then avoiding sexual misconduct. And avoiding lying. And then these 10, so we've got four so far, right? You're counting. <laughs> It goes into the other aspects of right speech, which I'll talk in more detail later about too. But it's, it's to avoid malicious speech or divisive speech, to avoid harsh speech, mean or um, coarse speech, and to avoid frivolous speech. And this afternoon, I'll see if I can make it clear why frivolous speech or gossip actually makes it into the top 10 on wholesome things. 
<laughs> it's kind of like, hmm. <laughs> okay. So I think now we have seven. And then the um, being free from longing is wholesome and longing or covetousness, wanting something, often something that's not ours, but that wanting or that greed, that's unwholesome. And any kind of ill will, so goodwill is wholesome. Um, the opposite of that wanting is letting go of things, sharing. Um, and then the last one is ignorance, wrong view. So having right view means knowing that these 10 things are important and actually putting them into action in our life. And whenever we see ourselves, you know, either thinking about doing some of those 10 unwholesome things or doing it or having done it, then we want to pay attention to that and not beat ourselves up. That doesn't really help. I don't know if you noticed that. It's like, it kind of just makes it worse. It's like, it's like doing something that's, that's unskillful and then being cruel to ourselves about it, <laughs> which is also unskillful. So the, the, um, the loving, kind, supportive, actually effective way to work with whatever we've done is to acknowledge it and forgive and learn from it and make the determination to not do that again. Um, not because we're bad or or something, but just because it doesn't work and it's not what we want. We want to live in a way that is uplifting to ourselves and to others. And it's kind of funny. Everybody knows what we like in other people. I don't know of anybody who doesn't like a humble person or a kind person. You know, it's like we all know what we admire and and somehow we think maybe we're not worthy of that or we can't pull it off or something. But we can, but it, it takes like little steps or, you know, just continual um, attention, care. And we'll talk about that too because one of the noble factors is right effort. Now we'll talk about how that works, not just in meditation, but in life. And it's beautiful to see the way all of these eight pieces of the Noble Eightfold Path work together and support each other. Because we have to bring in mindfulness if we're going to have some sense of whether we're doing something that's wholesome or unwholesome. It has to be there. And it strengthens the mindfulness as we practice, as well as our right view. So it all works together. And what they say when there's full enlightenment is that all those eight come together in a way that they can't even really be separated. So with right view, as we take it like this, these 10 wholesome things and their 10 opposites, we can really bring that into our, our thoughts and our words and our actions. So during this weekend, you're not gonna be doing much speaking. You'll still be doing a lot of acting because we have to. Um, and the, the truth is that no matter what we do, there's damage to living beings, but it's not intentional. You know, walk across the floor, maybe you step on an ant or a spider or something, but you don't want to, you don't mean to. And 
our thoughts, obviously, right, most of the time, we get a chance to work on our, think on our thinking, you know, which, which thoughts are wholesome and which thoughts are unwholesome. And that brings us into this second factor of right intention. And the Buddha said he divided his thoughts into two categories. This was before he became enlightened. And he put the wholesome thoughts in one category and the unwholesome thoughts in the other category. And he only had three kind of criteria. Is this a thought of renunciation. So renunciation, you know, doesn't get that much good press these days. <laughs> but it's like it's letting go. It's letting go and and renunciation is sharing. Um, the bhikkhuni I mentioned who I live with loves to share. And I, and I've really learned some nuances about sharing from her that I didn't have before. It's really sweet. And it's and you get to the point where you think, well, is there any is there really anything that I couldn't share? And it's it's like notice what what you want to hold on to for yourself. Or notice what you want if there's times when you want to take something from someone else. And it's not like again, don't think you're bad. This is normal. This is like we got into this life because we had the dark and the light in us. That's what human life is. It's got the good karma and the bad karma, and it's all a mix. If we were really, really, really like when when we're like so super purified, we're in some deva realm, some heaven realm where everybody's like really chill. <laughs> that ain't here. <laughs> and we're also not in those really, really, really ugly places because there's good. So we're in this mix, this human realm, this world. And we get to make choices. It's another thing I'm going to talk about later. It's like, I think, Tuesday night <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> Come here, I don't have to think about where. I don't have to think about when. They just <laughs> wheel me in and... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so we get to make choices. And the Buddha said we can make choices about what we think. Now, we have to make a distinction here about the thoughts that just run in, pop into our head. Those didn't come by choice. That came by history. And we're not, not really responsible for that. Um, I had a teacher a long time ago who said it's like tuning a radio. Well, nobody tunes a radio anymore, so I don't know if we can get a better metaphor. But you know, when you used to have a dial on the radio and it would go from station to station, you know, you get something, you know, some music and static, and then somebody talking and static. And anyhow, anything can come through. And our mind is like that. Anything can pop up in there. And I've seen people get really upset about things that'll just come into their mind. Like, how could I think that? It's like, well, don't worry about it. It's just old stuff. That's all it is. It's old stuff. And it can be old stuff from way back. Um, I actually happen to fully believe in past lives, and it can be stuff from who knows when, but it doesn't matter. When it comes, you can say, is this a thought I want to think? How would I feel if I died right now? Is this, is, would I like to be caught dead in this thought? <laughs> now, <laughs> the Buddha was like, okay, this thought of, of, of longing, of wanting, of craving, of greed, I'm putting that in the unwholesome category. And the thought of, renunciation, letting go, being free from that desire, those thoughts, that sharing, I'm going to put that in the wholesome category. 
And then he talked about thoughts of um, ill will and thoughts of cruelty. Actually, there are words I like better. Harmlessness, harmfulness, or harmful, harmlessness. So if he had a thought of ill will, wanting to harm, wanting to hurt, or anger, that went into the unwholesome category, of course. And goodwill, wanting to help, wanting to support it. Or in the Pali, it could be metta, loving kindness. And as we develop that and we have more of those thoughts and we put our attention more in that direction, eventually it's unconditional. The metta is unconditional love. And sometimes that can sound too lofty. You know, I've heard people say that for a human being, unconditional love is impossible. I can tell you for sure that's not true. It's just that we relax what we expect back from someone else. So if you're a parent or if you're a child of parents, which most of us have had that experience, <laughs> or someone caregiving, otherwise we probably wouldn't have made it this far, then we know that there can be these strong expectations of what we want in return for our love or what is wanted in return. You know, how parents can be, they want to live sometimes, they want to live through their children. They want them to be a certain way. Or we, want my, we might have a partner and we want that partner to be a certain way, to act a certain way towards us. And it's perfectly healthy and understandable that we encourage the people in our lives and we encourage ourselves to be kind and respectful and all of that. I'm not saying that, you know, there are no limits or boundaries. It's around being wholesome and unwholesome again. But the, but the fact that we can actually love without those requirements and that that love can really shine on everyone, all beings, like the sun, Love that's like the sun, it shines on everyone equally. So that's kind of the ultimate. But even just in your thoughts, any old thought coming up, is this a thought of goodwill or is this a thought of ill will? And put them in their proper categories. And the same with harmlessness or compassion thoughts of compassion and harmlessness, or thoughts of harming and cruelty, and putting them into their, into their proper categories. And, you know, we may think, well, it doesn't matter so much what I think, but the Buddha said that was the most powerful aspect of, you know, those three thought, words, and action, because it's the way we think that leads to what we say and what we do. And, I mean, it's not too hard to imagine what someone who takes a semi-automatic weapon to a playground, or in California, I'm very close to the Garlic Festival, That person had these thoughts, lots of them, around ill will, cruelty, and they let that build up and planned. This is horrible. And we have the opportunity to sift any, any inkling of any of that harmfulness out of our own mind and instead encourage all the goodwill, the compassion, not just for other people, but for ourselves. 
if we're mean to ourselves, we can't really be fully kind to others. It has to be for everybody. And it's this idea that somehow I don't count or it's okay to be hard on myself is part of wrong view. It's like, this is something that we can learn to change. That, that we can be less self-identified in a way that we can be just as kind and supportive of ourselves as we are of others. And we can be just as selfless Um, It works both ways, less greedy. And make the sharing between myself and everyone else more, more even, more balanced. And this is all part of right view and right intention. The wisdom to see that trying to gain things and hold on to them doesn't lead to happiness. It doesn't lead to peace. It doesn't lead to feeling better about ourselves or about the world. It's a loss. It's not a gain. So the Buddha warned against acquiring. Don't acquire things. But he was totally cool with people having wealth. It's not about the things. It's not about money. It's not about, it's about how we relate to it. Are we, are we open-hearted and generous? Or are we clinging? And you know, you can see it in people who have a lot and people who have very little. And a lot of times people who have very little are more generous. <laughs> Because the more people get, I, I feel like I noticed this um, where I live in Silicon Valley. During the, the time in the like 80s, 90s, whatever, you know, the real boom, all people could talk about, some people, were, their, were the values of their stocks. And... There was actually a a case in a county court where someone that I, um, a mutual, I have, we have a mutual friend. This man was convicted of murder and sent to life in prison and he didn't do it. They didn't even really have any real evidence. They wanted to hang it on someone and he happened to be Hispanic. It was horrible. I saw like there there was such a sense of entitlement in the whole area and it felt like people were getting more and more divisive the more they had or the more they thought they had until the bubble burst <laughs> but it's like it's like what a change in mentality in group mentality more protective and more demonizing of others Miracle of miracles, he did get set free later. His case was overturned. But did you see that that could happen? That a jury of people who are probably pretty intelligent could convict someone on nothing because they wanted to keep that out, punish. So this all starts in the mind, in our own mind. And the right view that grasping, clinging, owning, feeling like we're going to find some kind of safety and security in that. 
seeing that that's not, that doesn't work. Yes, being responsible about what we have and taking care of it. The Buddha praised to that. He said, you need to protect you, what you have from fire and floods and um, greedy kings and um, ungrateful relatives. <laughs> But it's not the same as, as uh, clinging and hoarding and um, selfishness, acquiring. So I want to encourage you for the next uh, couple hours. hour and a half, well, to lunch, really reflect on your thoughts. Which ones go in the wholesome category and which ones go in the unwholesome category? And if there's unwholesome ones, you know, what kind of wrong view might be behind that? What do I think about the way things work? First of all, do, do I believe this thought? <laughs> It's something that just popped in the mind. It's like, no. We just say no. I know. It's like, it's like when we have feeling, we can't just say no. We have to be present with it and observe it. And um, I mean, usually we can't just say no. We have to, like, it, saying no to feeling is usually suppressing it. And that doesn't work because it comes out in funny ways later. But the fact that the Buddha said, you can say no to thoughts, that's empowering. And he said those, those thoughts of, of letting go, renunciation, and thoughts of goodwill, and thoughts of harmlessness, he said, you can think that all day, and all night, and all week, and you might get tired from thinking, but that's the only harm that's going to happen. <laughs> it doesn't hurt anyone. And it doesn't lead to hurting anyone. And so as you go through the whole rest of the morning in meditation, if thoughts arise while you're doing your work, whatever it is, notice. Does this one go into the wholesome category? Does this one go into the unwholesome category? Have some, have, bring some wholesomeness around that some kindness and understanding around those unwholesome thoughts as well. And realize that, you know, wherever that came from, and we may know where it came from, we all have conditioning and we all have past actions. And they leave imprints. So it's just old stuff. I don't believe that anymore. Or I don't believe that. And the more we do that, the more the mind gets conditioned to be in the wholesome. And then we, we eventually start having fewer and fewer of those unwholesome ones popping in. And even when they do, because some of that old conditioning is pretty strong. Even when they do, then, you know, like my, my friend with the, <laughs> you know, it's like, Okay, there's that unwholesome thought. Mm. I don't do that anymore. And then, you know, like if there's some element of wrong view, some idea, some idea that my actions don't count, that's one kind of wrong view, or that my thoughts don't count, that there's no real result from good or bad actions, that's one kind of wrong view. That any of those unwholesome things are okay, that's a wrong view. And just, just see what you can find to purify the mind. And see what you can do to make this up 
enjoyable inquiry. Something that's interesting. I mean, you're fascinating. I don't know if you realize that. <laughs> that mind, wow, it's got so much potential and power and um, many little nooks and crannies to explore. And so see if you can enjoy the practice. I think that's probably enough said. Let's sit for about 20 minutes and then we'll do 